Yeah, there's going to be a homework one party this weekend. Woo! Have fun, everybody. <laughs> so, just a reminder, if no, for those of you not really paying attention, uh, September 27th, that's Sunday, program execution homework due. Um, and, uh, uh, and as we talked about, the deadlines for homeworks, they're much, they're harder deadlines than than the lecture questions. Lecture question is a soft, just recommended deadline. But for the homework assignments, if we don't, if I don't see a quality effort to try to complete the assignment before this deadline, uh, I'm not going to give you any extension. So some of you noticed in Autolab, I just picked a random date, I, October 11th, I think, for the end date. That doesn't mean you have, that doesn't necessarily mean you have until October 11th to complete it. I just didn't want you to not be able to submit right after the deadline. If you're done at 1 a.m. tomorrow morning, I still want you to be able to submit just in case you get that extension. So I just didn't want submissions to be turned off automatically at the deadline is the reason I put an extended deadline in Autolab. That doesn't mean you have that extension. And I know there's going to be students who who will think that they had that extension and said, I thought it was due October 11th. And just don't be one of those people. Uh, if you made an honest effort, especially if you uh, worked on the lab, if you attempted the lab and you have the lab, the hypothetical example, and you have the lab complete before this deadline, but maybe you only got objective one done on the actual homework itself, you know, in that case, you're going to get an extension. I don't know what the extension will be. It might just end up being October 11th by coincidence, but, uh, but it could be some other time. And depending on, uh, on your specific situation, it might be a shorter or longer deadline. It's going to be judgment calls. And, uh, in most of the grading in this course, especially with learning objective one verification this week happening, uh, a lot of the grading in this class and whether you actually completed a an objective or not is going to be assessed by myself, partly by the TAs, but I have to verify everything uh, to make sure my TAs don't go rogue or get too cruel or anything like that or get too soft. Um, but uh, just to keep consistency. But in the end, there's a human being, myself and the TAs, human beings looking over your work and deciding if you actually did complete the learning objectives. Did you actually complete those three bullet points for the learning objective? That's what I'm going to look at. The TAs can cross off your three bullet points, but I still have to verify. So if they check something off, I look at your work and it's just absolute crap. Uh, I'm going to ask you for more, uh, more stuff. On the other hand, if you didn't get all three bullet points, well, actually, you got to get all three bullet points. But even if it is close calls, but it looks like you have, maybe I see something in your code. It's like, wow, they did something pretty advanced here. Uh, I'm going to verify that and and uh, let you get those, let you get completion for that. So for your homework assignment, it deciding the deadline extensions, it's going to work the same way. I'm going to look at what you've done before this deadline. If you didn't put an honest effort in and you just said, ah, I'll get an extension on everything, which I'm sure someone's saying right now. Uh, you're probably not going to get the deadline extension. And then at that point, you're playing for an A minus in the course. You can't get an A anymore if you miss this deadline. This is the first deadline that really matters, that really holds some weight. Uh, but as long as you show me effort and show that you did really work at it to try to complete the homework by this deadline and didn't just rely on getting an extension that you haven't received yet, um, as long as you've tried, you'll get some sort of extension. Uh, and I do that because this is pass-fail grading. You either complete that application objective or you don't. That's it. There's no half credit. There's nothing like that. Uh, so if this was a strictly hard deadline and you were almost finished, you almost had everything, but there was just something in the primary objective unit testing in Autolab that you just couldn't figure out and you know you ran out of time. I don't want to just throw a zero at you. That's the reason for the extensions. The extensions are not meant for, oh, don't worry about the homework. You don't have to do that yet because uh, uh, because you will you can rely on an extension. That's not the point. And in those cases, I'll just say no extension for you. You get a zero for this application objective. That said, I'll probably be more lenient given that it's the first assignment. But later on the semester, I'm going to just be like, look, you didn't try. You can't get this one anymore. Uh, there was another announcement that I wanted to make. Oh, yeah, the new homeworks. Where are we? Uh, calculator and microwave, they've been posted. The graders are posted. 
The lab graders are not live yet, but there's a column for lab. You'll always get a zero for that, so don't worry about that yet. Until the lab on next Thursday, the pre-homework lab. The next week and pretty much every week for the rest of the semester, there's going to be an interview and also a Thursday lab. So be aware of that. Please don't miss anything. Uh, but calculator and microwave. These two assignments, they're somewhat similar in that you're coding the uh, back end of an interface. For the calculator, it's a four-function calculator with a clear button uh, that you have to code the logic for. You have the GUI in the handout assignment, and you have to build all the logic to make this calculator work as you would expect a calculator to work, or rather, how it's defined in this document. Make sure you read all the specs very carefully. Make sure you have everything coded the way it's supposed to work as defined in this document. And uh, that alone, let's be honest, that's a 115 assignment, maybe late in the semester, but it's a 115 assignment to get this calculator working. What makes it a 116 assignment is that you cannot use control flow for this assignment, this or microwave. You cannot use control flow. That means no conditionals, no ifs, else if, else, match, case, try, catch, anything that you can use to conditionally execute code. This includes loops, since you can use loops to conditionally execute code a certain number of times, so no for loop, no while loop, no do while. No other way to be able to simulate these conditionals or loops, for example, short circuit evaluations, if you know what that is, those could be used to simulate a conditional. None of that allowed. You cannot say anywhere in your code can you have some logic that says can either if this is true, run this code. If it's false, run this other code. Cannot do that. So that's what makes this a 116 assignment. How the hell do we calculate how the hell do we build the logic for this calculator without using any control flow? It seems counterintuitive uh, at first. You should be thinking, that's impossible. I promise you it's possible. And we'll see mostly how to do that next week when we talk about the state pattern. The intended solution is to use the state pattern for those assignments and complete it that way. We're going to have three lectures and three lecture questions on the state pattern easing you into this idea of writing code without using conditionals. And I'll, um, and I'll throw this out there right away. Uh, I am not saying that conditionals are bad by any means. Some students get that impression that, oh, if statements and loops are bad practice. Not at all. I'm just artificially restricting what you can do to force you to use the state pattern. There's nothing bad about conditionals at all. They're, they're part of programming. They're a big part of what we do. But when we learn the state pattern, I want to force you to use the state pattern. And by taking away control flow, it pushes you into forcing you to actually use this state pattern to be able to make decisions based on the types of your of your objects instead of the values of your objects. You're not checking if some value conditionally runs some code. You're just saying, hey, object, do your thing. And based on its implementation, using inheritance and polymorphism, based on its specific implementation, it'll do different things based on its type. And that's what we'll see all next week. So that's what's coming up. It, feel free to look at, the, uh, look at the assignments and get a good idea of what's going on with those. But for today, we want to talk about an application of polymorphism in JSON. Let's move this a little. This homework is so terrifying. Wait till you see the next one. Uh, this one is terrifying, though. I'm not. I don't mean to belittle that. Uh, but it won't be as we go through next week. I think you'll see that it's not as crazy as it sounds at first, because I it should sound crazy right now because I'm taking away a fundamental part of your programming arsenal, your ifs and loops, conditionals and loops. Um, but I haven't yet showed you what to replace them with. I haven't showed you an alternative option. So right now it's going to seem impossible just because I haven't taught you what it is. Unless you read ahead, if you look ahead at the slides and lectures, then you'll be able to do it. Yeah, exactly, Lana. Yeah, so the I'll foreshadow a bit here. I'll, I'll spoil a little bit that's coming up. The next round of assignments, when we get to functional programming, I'm going to ban var. 
You'll get your control flow back. You'll get your conditionals and loops back. But you can't use var. That means you can never have a value in your program that's changing. Once you declare a variable, that variable will always store that value for its lifetime. Never changing, never updating anything. So that's uh, that's what's coming up there. And again, there's nothing wrong with var, but I artificially restrict you to force you to use functional programming. Life is short, choose calculator. I think, I argue with the TAs back and forth. They have, some of them have different opinions. I think these assignments are pretty well balanced in terms of difficulty. Um, but some, uh, some think calculator is easier, some think microwave is easier. I think the general consensus is that calculator is a little bit easier. Um, but I would have said microwave is a little bit easier. I thought microwave, when I first made these assignments, I thought microwave was going to be a good bit easier than calculator. Anyway, let's talk about JSON. So make your own judgment call. Pick the one that you're more interested in. Make your own judgment call on the, as to which one's harder or which one's more interesting. Don't listen to chat. You can listen to chat, but in this case, in this case, do your own thing. Um, or not. I, who am I to say? Who cares? I give you the option so you get to choose. Uh, so the lecture question today in a package OOP JSON, make a store with this definition. So I'm giving you the basic definition of a store. This you can um, you can just copy right into your code, type it as is, nothing wrong with that. Your goal here is to implement the as JSON and from JSON methods and no testing for this one. I um, For this, you don't have to write a test suite to test this functionality. But an as JSON, which is going to return a JSON string representing this store, with two as a JSON object with two keys and two values, keys cache and register, which is going to store this variable from this, uh, the value from the state variable, and also inventory, which is going to be a an array in, um, in JSON storing the elements of this list, this inventory list uh, under the inventory key. And then from JSON, getting a JSON string in the same format that as JSON returns uh, set the state variables cache and register and inventory to the values from that um, from that JSON string. So we want to convert to and from JSON with this specific data structure. Toltfish out. Would you just stop by for a little bit, Toltfish? Um, all right. So a reminder of JSON. This is uh, 115 material, of course. JSON, you, you've seen this you, uh, this structure. You've built web apps that communicated through JSON strings. So a quick reminder on what JSON is. It's a, a, a string structure for data. So it's completely textual. It's just strings, which any language that we use can interpret. Every language can read strings. It's just sequence of characters um, communicated through bytes. So it's a way to represent six types of data using only strings, which are universal. And then those strings are formatted in such ways that they can represent strings, numbers, booleans, arrays, objects, and null. These are the only six types that we can represent in JSON. And with these six types, we can represent all kinds of different complex information. JSON is highly flexible just by given these six types. And especially the fact that we can nest these types, we can have an object of strings to numbers and strings to booleans and we can have an array of objects we can mix and match these in any way we can which makes json very popular so in python and javascript this was super easy if we had a python data structure either a list or a dictionary we could call json.dumps on that data structure and convert it to a json string easy peasy we're done if we have a JSON string and we want to convert it to a Python data structure, whether it's a string, a, a number, a uh, an int or a float, a an array, a dictionary, an array of dictionaries, whatever, whatever the case may be, we want to take that JSON string and convert it to its appropriate Python types. We just say json.loads, done. Easy peasy. So going from Python types to 
JSON strings and vice versa. Easy peasy. JavaScript, same thing. We've got JavaScript types, arrays, and objects. We want to convert those into JSON strings. JSON.stringify, done. Uh, other way around, we have a JSON string. We want to convert it to our JavaScript types. JSON.parse, easy peasy. Two languages done in one slide. So what are we talking about today if JSON is this easy, which usually 115 students think, looking at this lecture, I've gotten this comment before before the lecture happened. They're like, why are we learning JSON so, like, so late and right in the middle of OOP? We did this in 115 in two different languages and it was easy as hell. Uh, so, uh, so why is this so difficult in Scala that's going to take up a whole lecture? So let's take an example and talk about how we might do this in Scala. And just, just to foreshadow a bit, the trick here is that Scala is strongly typed. We're hitting one of the implications of what does it mean to work in a strongly typed language? So JSON, we're going to have this JSON string. It's a representing a JSON object with keys, timestamp, message, and ISS position, and values of a long, which is the timestamp of this message, a string for the message, uh, the actual message that's being sent, and then another JSON object as the value for at ISS position which contains keys as strings, latitude, and longitude, and values as strings, which represent the actual latitude and longitude. Don't ask me. I'm sure there's a, a good reason, or at least a, a reason, why these are not doubles, why these are not JSON numbers, and why they're represented as strings. I don't know the answer to that, but this uh, this is from the International Space Station API that you can request to get the lat long of the ISS at any given time. Uh, so this is data from that actual API. At this exact timestamp, this is where the ISS was. This is real data. Uh, but they represent it as strings, these values as strings in this uh, in this API. I don't know why, but I'm sure they have some good reason. Uh, so this is valid JSON. This is a good uh, positive JSON string. And when we want to convert this JSON string into Scala types so we can work with it, actually parse this information and work with this information directly, what type do we use? How can we represent this in our Scala code? We obviously can store this entire thing as a string, but once we want to say grab the latitude out of that string, how are we going to do that? How do we represent that string in a more useful data structure? that we can actually ask it for its values. So we have a few options that we have. Maps, good, yeah, good. Uh, we're, we're getting started there. So we wanna use a map. We have a, a clear key value, key value situation here. So let's try to store this in a map. And we notice that all the keys are strings. In JSON, the keys are always strings. So we can map strings to something else. And that can get us started on what we're doing here. So let's start with a map of string to string. This one will actually work uh, decently well because we're mapping strings. And then what they map to, even though some of these aren't strings, this is a, a uh, JSON number, which will have to be a long in Scala. And this is a JSON object, which could be another map. But if we just map them to their strings, their JSON strings, so instead of parsing through this, just represent as another JSON string, we can get part of the way there. But we also can't say, hey, map, give me your key at value ISS position, and then give me the latitude of that. We still have some more work to do if we want to use strings. So let's try something else. Long, that's great for timestamp to long. But message to success, how are we going to represent the value success is a long? Are we going to represent this object as a long? It's not really going to work for us. Uh, maybe a map of string to string. That's going to be fine for ISS position. This is a string to another map of string to string. So that works for that one. Great, but not quite for message and timestamp. We're not going to be able to represent this number as a map of string to string. So we have some issues here. We have three different data types that we want to store as one data type so we can say map of string to that data type but we don't have a good way of doing that at least not yet uh, one way that does work is a map of string to any 
So whether we have a long, a string, or a map of string to strings, those all do inherit from any. Using our type hierarchy, we can store all of those in values of type any and have a map of type string to any where the any, the actual values in this map are long string and map of string to string. So we can do this. This one works, but it's horribly restricting. Remember, if we store, uh, so we can use polymorphism to make this happen, but if we store a variable, say a map of string to strings, or a value of type map string to string, and a variable of type any in this case, we're restricted to only using the methods from the any class, which is going to give us a two string, a dot equals, and not much else. We certainly can't say, hey, any, give me the value at key ISS or at key latitude. We can't do that when it's stored in a variable of type any. So this is the only way we can get all the information. I shouldn't say the only way, but this is a way that we can get all the information in a single data structure, but it's way too restrictive since we can only use the methods defined in the any class. It's not going to give us the functionality that we want. So let's talk about other options. So the problem that we're facing is that Scala is strongly typed. Once we define a variable, it has to be a specific type and we can't mix types. This is the same thing that made JSON really easy in Scala, or Scala um, Python and JavaScript because you can mix types. Those are not strongly typed languages and you can mix types. You can have a Python list that has uh, uh, integers, ints, strings, and uh, dictionaries as its elements. That's perfectly fine. This would be in Python, a dictionary that just has these key value pairs and Python lets you mix the types all you want. Same with JavaScript. So that's why JSON was no big deal in those languages. Now that we're strongly typed, we need to be able to store all these types in the same data structure. And to do that, we're going to use some polymorphism because we cannot mix types in Scala data structures without polymorphism. With polymorphism, we can use this map of string to any, which works using polymorphism, but it's not very helpful. So let's come up with a better solution of how we can store all these values in the same data structure. And for that, we're going to ask for the help of a library. We're going to use the play JSON library. This does not come with Scala. So this is another thing we have to add to our POM and download from uh, from the internet to get. And I'll, I'll give more details on the Maven side of this uh, towards the end of lecture. But let's talk about what this library is that we're going to use and what it does. So the big thing that it does for us is defines six classes, so six types, for each of the six uh, JSON types. JavaScript, uh, JSON strings, numbers, booleans, arrays, objects, and nulls are going to be represented by these six classes that are defined in the library. If you look through the code of the library, there's class JS string, and then the definition of a JS string. Class JS number, class JS boolean, class JS array, class JS object, class JS null. So, uh, so we have these six types and where the magic comes in, where the polymorphism comes in, is that all of these types extend a seventh type JS value. So this is actually class JS string extends JS value. So each of these six types inherits all of the functionality of JS value, which is how we're going to store all of these types in the same data structure and how we're going to parse these JSON strings. So now with that, with these six types that all extend JS value, our answer becomes more clear. This is going to be a map of strings because the keys are always strings to JS values and the JS values will actually be of type JS number, JS string and JS object. So now we can store all of this information in a single data structure. Yeah, you don't have to can you uh you don't have to i mean you could if you wanted to but you don't have to actually write the parser for json uh, writing a json parser is actually pretty tricky there, there's a lot involved with that uh, it's not something it's not something that's particularly interesting it's just a very tedious thing you might do it in a later course where that's really what they're teaching you 
But here, I'd rather skip past the details, pull them to the library, and show you how to uh, how to write your programs at a higher level. So now with this library, we're going to create our map of string to JS string, and now we can mix types in our data structure as long as all the types that we're mixing uh, extend the type that we define, that we declare. Uh, we're yeah we're we're using all the types by, but mostly JS value is the one that you're you're not really going to specify the other types in your code. You only directly work through JS value, but you'll call methods, and when you call those methods, you you'll get different inherited methods based on what the actual type is. So if I have a JS a variable of type JS value that stores a JS uh, a JS number, for example and I call a method on that, it's going to, it can have different behavior than if I call that same method on a variable of type JS value that stores a, uh, a JS string. So we're going to get different behavior implicitly, but we don't actually have to see those six subclasses in their differences. We do everything through JS value and just get different functionality based on how each of those six methods, uh, how each of those six classes overrides the methods defined in the JS value class. You're welcome. So the JS, th this library has, um, has methods to be able to convert to and from Scala types to these JS types. And uh, let's skip to an example. So let's see an example of reading JSON and an example of writing JSON. So to use this library, what exactly is JSON doing? Uh, yeah, those of you who, who didn't take the 115 here, JSON is a way to represent complex pieces of information, complexly, complexly structured data, and convert it to a string. So our JSON, when we, ever, when we have a JSON, uh, JSON information, uh, information formatted as a JSON string, it's always a string. And the nice thing about strings is any language can read them. And then each language, it's up to them to convert that JSON formatted string into information that's consumable by that language specifically. So our goal here in reading JSON is to take a string that has a very specific format. Like for um, like in JSON, these braces represent objects, which are key value pairs separated by commas. And I don't have an example on this slide, but if we use brackets, that's an array, which is like a just a sequential data structure of information. So we use it mostly to communicate between languages, primarily on the internet. So if we have the internet, we have usually JavaScript running in the browser, connecting to a server running and who knows what language, any language. And we want that JavaScript to be able to consume that information. So we convert it to the information to a JSON string send that string over the internet as a sequence of bytes and then on the uh, on the javascript side it converts those that sequence of bytes to a string and then parses the string into whatever data it is it happens to be whether it's key value pairs like this or whatever information um, whatever information is registered uh, is represented by that string so if this is the string that we want to parse, how are we going to do that? JSON is freaking neat. Uh, so in one sixteen or in one fifteen, we go through the progression, where at first you know we're just using strings and numbers and stuff, and then we move on to using CSV, comma separated values, which is a way of representing similar way representing data as a string. But all you can do is just have a uh, effectively an array of values. And separate each value by a comma, and that's uh, that's all you can do. And then you can have a file with multiple CSV lines to effectively get a 2D array. But once you go beyond that, once you want like one of the columns of a CSV file to be a key value pair with a variable number of keys and values, uh, it gets messy. You can't really do much with it after that. So then we go on to JSON, which can which is holding up pretty well and can represent 
pretty much any data, any information you want to communicate. JSON is able to handle that you know, through this, through just six values, six different types. It's really phenomenal how flexible JSON notation is. Uh, so that's why we use JSON. So if we want our Scala program communicating with some Python program, or what we'll do later in the semester, we have a Scala program that's setting up a WebSocket server and communicating to a JavaScript front end over the internet. Uh, we got to communicate between Scala and JavaScript somehow. And JSON is a solution just waiting for us to have that question. JSON is there to say, I am here to solve exactly that. So we use JSON because it's uh, holding up well. It's pretty ubiquitous for networking, network communication like this. Um, and uh, it really doesn't have many competitors, uh, especially in networking. And if it's uh, like a configuration file for a specific program, there are other formats that people like to use. Um, or if it's storing, which was mentioned uh, in chat a little earlier, if it's storing information in a database, like uh, like MongoDB is going to use BSON, which is a similar um, similar different approach, but similar solving the similar problem of representing data in a way that's consumable by other programs. All right, so let's go through this example. So let's use this library to extract all the values out of this thing, uh, and most notably the latitude and longitude. How do we get these values out of there? So first. We're using a separate library, so we're going to have to import it. We're using the play API libs JSON. Like this is the package that these classes are. We want to use JS value and JSON. Notice that we're not actually using JS string, JS number. We're not using those classes, those subclasses directly. We're just coding everything to that super class that's inherited by all of those. So we can um, so we can use this polymorphism by coding everything to the super class and then not caring which actual class we're working with. We don't care which actual type this is. I mean, we do, uh, but but in another way we don't. Uh, we do because we have to convert it to the actual Scala types, but we don't when we're actually declaring the types. I don't have to convert this to a JS number or a JS object before using it. I'm just gonna keep it as a JS value and then take advantage of the underlying methods that are overridden. So let's import these two things. And then the big line, this is the, the one that does all the heavy lifting, all the actual token parsing and and, uh, uh, and reading all the format of JSON, reading braces and what do quotes mean and colons and commas and all that stuff. JSON.parse. So we're going to go to this JSON class, this JSON object, sorry, this JSON object, which has a parse method we're going to parse this string, assuming that this string is stored in a variable named response. So we're going to parse that string, and that's going to return a JS value, something that extends JS value. In this case, it should be returning a JS object, since the top level data structure, the top level type is a JS object. So it should actually be a JS object stored in this variable, but through the magic of polymorphism, we don't care what type is returned, we're just going to store it in a JS value. So it could have been a number, a string, whatever, an array. We're just going to store it in a JS value and then work with that JS value. Yeah, is Andrew Paul, there's specific uh, formatting rules for JSON strings. And yeah, the, the braces define an object, which is our key value pair. Brackets define an array, which is our sequential data structure. Double quotes define strings. If I have a value that's not in double quotes, and that value is either null, uh, making it null value, true or false, making it a Boolean, if it's not one of those three, it's going to be a number, and it's going to be treated as uh, as such. Those are kind of the, the general rules of, of JSON. And JSON.parse takes care of all that for us viewership has I blocked the viewer number with my mic so I don't get depressed 89 uh, it's uh, I know a lot of students are watching the uh, watching the VODs but not nearly as many as should be not nearly enough to overcome that low viewership but anyway um, so uh, 
So we parse this thing as into a JS value, which in this case should actually be a JS object, but we're going to store it in a variable of type JS value, and then work with that as though it were a JS object. So when it comes to parsing JSON, it's very informat and it's very important to understand the structure of the data you expect. So when I get this string from the API, the API guarantees that it's going to give me a JS a J, JSON object with keys, timestamp, message, ISS position, with values that are number, which is specifically formatted as an integer value or a long that we'll need here because this will overflow an int, a string, and then an object of string to strings. This, this uh, API is always going to give me a JSON string in this exact format. And that's important because I'm going to hard code my code here to expect that exact format. So now when I want to get some values out of these keys, parsed, since it is an object, it has this method backslash, which is going to give me the value at a particular key. So parsed slash message, that's going to give me the value at the key message, which should be the string success here. It'll give me that as a JS value. But since I know because of the API documentation, I know that that JS value should actually be a JS string. I can try to convert it to a string. And to do that, we use these as methods with brackets around a type that we want to convert it to. So if we do dot as string, it's going to attempt, the library will attempt to convert this value into a string, a Scala string. And now once it's as a Scala string, now we know what to do with this. Whatever you can do with a Scala string, you can do with this value, this message. And if all went well, it should have the string success in it. Do not use to string here. Do not do dot to string. If you do, you're just looking for a bad time. Uh, what to string does is uh, it'll preserve the quotes and it'll be the string success, but with the quotes around it. As string is going to strip the quotes out because it's going to parse this as a, JS a Java JSON value and remove the quotes for you and just get the actual string itself, not the notation that tells JSON that this is a, a string or tells anybody interpreting it that's a JSON string. As string is going to remove the double quotes. And when you're looking at testing feedback or auto lab feedback or anything, and it just says everything broke, and your issue is that you had double quotes around your string when you weren't supposed to, it's a frustrating one. Don't fall into that trap. I've seen too many students do that. As, whenever we're converting JS values to Scala types, dot as, and then the type you want to convert it to. Always, always, always. You always use the as method. The as method is part of this JSON, this play JSON library. The two string method is part of the any class from Scala. Those are two very different things. And uh, parse, likewise, we can get the timestamp out of this. So let's get the timestamp value. We expect from the documentation of the API, we expect them to have a JS number in that as the value at that key. So we can convert that to an int. The only problem is this number is too big. We expect these timestamps to be too large for an int. It's going to overflow an int and give us all kinds of, of uh, garbage information. So here we have to use a long just to make sure we're avoiding the overflow errors. So let's do as long and store that in a um, variable of type long. And now since it's in a variable of type long, that's a Scala type, we're comfortable with that one. If you're not comfortable with long, just pretend that says int. You can do all the same stuff with longs as you can with ints. Uh, they just use 64 bytes instead of 32 bytes to represent the value. Uh, and then we have timestamp as along, do whatever we want. Message and timestamp, cool. Same thing with ISS position. As long as we're using Scala, met Scala types in the as method, this library understands what the Scala types are because the people who wrote this library coded all the Scala basic types, the ones that you were expected to uh, that it should be expected to be able to use. That includes string, long, int, um, and map of string to string. Since string is a Scala type that the library knows about, and map is a type that the Scala library knows about, we can take the ISS position and go right to a, sh a map of string to string. Since we have 
the all the values in this map are the same type of this object are the same type we can go right to map string to string and skip some intermediate steps we could get this as a js value and then get the latitude or longitude uh, separately or we can just go to a map of string to string and then say iss location dot get latitude dot get longitude um, convert those to doubles as we'll probably want to dot to double and uh, be able to do all the magic that we want we can we have this location on the earth we can do whatever we're using this thing for we can go for it is that parse slash a default syntax for maps in Scala I don't think it's default syntax for maps I don't think that method exists in maps but that's for a JS value has this method and then JS object has this method uh, overridden to be able to get the value, the JS value at a particular key. That's not part of the Scala map. It's part of the JS value from this library that we pulled in. That has this method defined. What if we don't know the format of the response? You you have to always know the format of the response. So whenever you're like connecting to a web API, it they're going to have detailed documentation saying this is the format of the string that I'm going to return. If they don't have that documentation, honestly use a different API because those coders don't know what they're doing. Uh, and for like homework assignments, when you use, use JSON, I will very specifically and meticulously define this is the exact format that you should be using for your JSON strings. That'll always be defined before you start writing code. There'll be some documentation for that make string i don't know why you want to use that kylan somebody asked about that last time didn't they too i mean if that works for you and it does and you understand what it does and it does exactly what you need it to do exactly the same things that i'm talking about here fine but if you don't fully understand what that does stay away from it in general just stay away from things you don't understand Yeah, same thing. Dusty crop hop. That's uh, you. You'll always know the format that's expected. Big int. Yeah, uh, I don't know if this play library, play JSON library, knows about big ints, but you could use that if uh, uh, if it does. Unless it's part of the problem description that I give that says you have to use long or have to use int, for example. But big int is a really cool class. It's a powerful class. Big int, for those who don't know, it's not restricted to like 32 or 64 bits. It's integer values of arbitrary size. So you can have ridiculously huge um, values as big ints. Yeah, the slash is kind of like the dot get, but for JS values. Blue Jays. The Buffalo Blue Jays. Uh, so let's talk about the opposite example. Let's look through the same example, but writing JSON. Are we, I always get tripped up on this 240, this class sets 240. So let's get through writing JSON. This, uh, this lecture is not too big cause I like to go through this one nice and slow. This is your first real useful application of polymorphism. So we're still digesting what polymorphism is at this point. So I like going slow here and cutting down the slides. So let's see the same thing, but in reverse. I'm going to make write some method, create JSON, which takes all the values that I want to use. And I define some uh, a location class. It just has a, uh, where are we? Latitude and longitude as doubles, as its state variables, as the state variables of that class. If you want to see the location class, I didn't uh, jam it on a slide just to keep the slides down a little, but it's in the repo if you want to check that out. So if we have these values as JSON type or Scala types, and we want to convert them to JSON types, JSON strings of the appropriate types or JS values, as we'll see here, we can use that same JSON object that we used before. We use the JSON dot parse. We're going to use that same object, but it has another method called to JSON which is going to convert some type, any type that the library is coded to know about. So this does not include types that you've created. 
So I can't say to JSON of location because location is a type that I created. So the programmers of the library don't know about it. But I can say to JSON, and that's going to convert whatever value you give it into a JS value. Now, in this case, the timestamp is a long, so it will, in fact, uh, convert this to a JS number. But we don't have to care about that because we're going to store it in a variable of type JS value. In fact, we can't store this in a, a variable of type JS number, even though it is a JS number in this case, because the toJSON method returns a JS value. The return type of this method is JS value. So even though it's actually returning a JS number in this case and a JS string in the next case, uh, we have to store it in a JS value because the return type of the method is JS value. In Scala, the compiler is going to check our types to make sure everything fits together. And if we try to store this in a subclass variable and re but return a JS value, it's not going to work for us. It's going to crash. Not going to happen. But these two values are, in fact, JS, um, uh, JS number and JS string. So when we use them, when we call our met methods on these variables, on the objects, uh, the references of objects stored in these variables, we actually are calling the methods from JS number and JS string because those methods were overridden in those classes and they each have their own definition. So even though these are both type JS value, the variables, since the types, the actual types, the concrete types stored in them are different, we're going to get different functionality from each of them. And that's one of the key points of polymorphism is the behavior of these, of these objects actually depends on the actual type and what methods they've overridden and how they've overridden these methods, what functionality they've overridden them to have not the method defined in the class of the variable type. This type has to have that method defined, but as long as it was overridden differently for each of the subtypes, we can get different behavior out of these, uh, out of these objects. Uh, and then we can start combining these. Do I not have a box for that? And then we can start combining these. Uh, and sorry, let's back up a step. We can combine the uh, the. We can break apart the location. So location has latitude and longitude as doubles. This API, we're going to follow the same standard. So we're going to make sure those are strings before we send them to make sure if we're sending this JSON string out, it better be in the exact same format that we got it in. Um, so on the other end when people have their stuff hard-coded to use these as strings, we're not messing them up by making them doubles. We don't want to mess everybody up. So the structure is clearly defined. We have to follow the structure. So we're going to convert these doubles into strings. I'm going to put those in a map of string to string. And once we have that as a map of string to string, we can convert that to JSON as well. So we have these JS values. It happens to be a JS number, a JS string, and a JS object. But we don't care. We just let the library handle that and call them all JS values. Now to get the next level, when we uh, want to combine all these values and get the top level object for our JS string, I'm going to create, and by the way, there are many different ways to do it. This is just the way I ended up structuring it. I'm going to throw all those in a map of string to JS value and here I can start mixing those, even though these are three different types. I'm going to just say, give me a map of string to JS value, and then get those top level key names and map them to the top level values that I want. Throw that in a map of string to JS value, throw that in a variable, or value in this case. And then I can use my to JSON method again, a to JSON method on a map of string to JS value, and that's going to give me a single JS value with all of this information in it, all of the information that I want. Once I have that, we have this nice JSON.stringify method, and that's going to convert this into a string that's formatted the way that we expect. So this will this method returns string. So our last line, this is going to return a string, 
and that's going to be the return of this method. It's going to return that JSON, uh, a Scala string, but formatted properly according to JSON. And yeah, almost JavaScript syntax there. If it was capital S O N, it'd be exactly JSON syntax. Yeah, JS Valley makes this tons easier. Oh, I'm I'm slowing down. Uh, I forgot I want to talk about Maven too. So we introduced a new library. This is uh, easier than uh, I made it in the past. Before I only, excuse me. Before I only gave you this as the POM file, POM.xml. Uh, but I ended up giving you the full pom.xml in the examples repo. If you're just cut and pasting that across all your projects, that's fine. And it already has the play library, this JSON library in it. So if you're just using that pom.xml, it's just one less thing you have to worry about because it's not, you know, it's not directly a topic of the course, um, pom.xml and Maven. It is important, but I toned down how much I require from you. But if this was your pom.xml, we would need to add the... Uh, the dependency for this library. So here we're listing all our dependencies in between these two tags. The one that we've used already is Scala test, and we have that dependency defined in this XML format. And to get the next library, what we can do is search this wonderful website, mavenrepository.com, and get this string for any library that we want. There are tons of libraries here at this website for you to get. If you're interested in um, in doing anything else with programming and you want to write some Scala program, check out this repository and see what kind of libraries are out there freely available and, and uh, see what you can do with what's out there. There are tons of libraries that make really complex things pretty easy to use that people are willing to write and share with you for free. Take advantage of that. There's There are millions of libraries at that site. And bring us back to our lecture question. So I want to quickly go to, like, if I was recording you to make your own pom.xml files like I did in the past, I would go play JSON. I would pick the version. Make sure you choose for Scala 2.12. And it gives you what to paste in your Maven file directly. You copy that. It even copies it for me. I don't even have to control C. And then I would go into my pom.xml, paste that, and then I get that. I have that library. Maven will download it for me and link it to my project. So if I want like machine learning, it's going to give me all kinds of libraries about machine learning. I can choose what I want and grab that dependency, I paste that in my uh, in my pom.xml. And bam, I have that library available to me. Easy peasy. All right, so that's technically the end of lecture. But I do plan to do some, uh, do a little more example. After, I want to start spending this 20 minutes on uh, more, more example stuff. Or if everybody just wants to chat, that's fine too. Not too picky, really. I haven't used this in a while. It's still on the Stack Overflow. for a demo of today's lecture question. I mean, oh, why? I feel like you asked for that every day, P. If you asked for demos of previous lecture questions, I'd be more likely to do it. Um, I'm not going to demo today's lecture question. Are we going to learn exception handling in this course? No, not directly. Um, that is one topic. Like, if I were to add something, that would probably be it. Or at least that's on my short list of things to add, but... I'm sure you, most of you agree, this class is pretty stuffed as it is. I don't want to be adding more things to it. Uh, I've been cutting things over the years, actually. So, uh, this course used to be the first iteration of the new redesign. It was a bit out of control. 
I've cut some of the non-essentials out of it since then. Nice that's that Scala. So this will actually uh, contact the API. It'll get the current uh, current location and give us exactly where the ISS is right now. So this is live data of right now where is the ISS. Please do demos of previous LQ. I know as soon as I said that, I'm like, well, obviously someone's going to ask for that. Um, I would need a specific one. If there's one that's causing a lot of trouble, I can talk about it more in depth. If I need a specific one, I'm just going to go over any of them. Or all of them, rather. Or whatever one I pick. You showed demos of previous lecture question after every week. Not after every week. I mean, I'll go over some more details. I'm not going to do solutions for lecture questions because you still have to do those to prove that you completed the learning objective. Uh, but if you want me to go over something similar to the lecture questions, but not I, exactly what it is, that I would go through full examples of. Uh, so let's take a look at this library. Very. So we have this JS value as a, a sealed trait. We can think of that as a class for now. And we see that JS, oh, here we go, an object. No, it's different. Uh, and we can see that it has all these types that extend JS value. So JS null extends JS value, doesn't override any functionality. Actually, I wanted to go back up here. Um, readable has an as method so uh, js value which extends js readable has the as method that takes a type and then tries to convert to that type and it should have the slash method transform and validate extends any where's the slash me method come from Oh, they do it like that. That's why. Ugh. All right. Uh, so we have our... Where was I? Come on. JS null. We have our JS boolean, which is going to define some boolean-specific functionality. Classes for true and false for, I'm sure, some good reason. Uh, JS number. Extends, again, extends JS value. JS array, again, extends JS value. Array is going to add some functionality that's array specific. It's for uh, iterators, adding elements, prepending, uh, appending. Uh, JS object, which is going to add object specific functionality. Getting the keys, getting the values. Adding, removing elements. I want to get to the good stuff. Object. Uh, JS object. Hey, where is the good stuff? This is why I didn't do this during lecture. Navigating somebody else's library is always risky because uh, I might not find what I'm looking for. Where is... Where do they add the slash method? That's what... So I want to find where's this method to find in JS lookup. JS lookup extends any val, and then it's going to add functionality to other classes. Ooh. And for arrays, for example, the slash method is going to uh, take an index and then give me the value at that specific index. For a dictionary, it's going to take the key the name of the key and then give me the value at that key uh, and how are those so I wanna now I'm just curious though how are those used in JS value It's grabbing that 
functionality from JS Lookup. Uh, it's interesting. Anyway, you you didn't come here to watch me paw through a library. Uh, but that's where all our functionality is is coded. The biggest thing I wanted to show you was that we have JS value and all those JS null, JS boolean. They're all going to extend JS value. Oh, here's a an example of mixed ins, by the way. Uh, somebody asked before, can we have multiple inheritance? You can extend one class, but then you can use mixins with the with keyword. But the mixins have to be traits. I don't understand because there is no testing. Uh, Monday this week. First OOP. What was... talk about it electronics so this one was asking you to uh, to use some inheritance this is our first sampling of inheritance uh, demo of adding to the pom the pom uh, I'll demo that if there's time but uh, if you just take the pom.xml from the examples repo it already has the JSON library in it and you don't. There's nothing for you to do there. Since I made that so easy, I don't really. I don't want to take up too much time with it. I'd rather talk about this lecture question. Jesse said, "Create his own libraries." Hell yeah. But again, with time, I would create my own libraries. Uh, so for this one, you're asked to create a superclass electronic, which is going to be extended by both flashlight and boombox. So the flashlight class here is going to have the exact same functionality that you had in the previous lecture question. It's going to have the same exact functionality, but some of that functionality is going to be borrowed from the electronic class. So for example, the state variable of type battery, that's going to be defined in the electronic class. Uh, the same way you did with the flashlight, it's going to create that state variable. Set it, it can set it to some random default value. And then flashlight and boombox will both set that variable to the appropriate value. So in the flashlight class, we're going to set that va battery variable using this dot battery to a battery with a charge of five. And the boombox is going to take a battery in its constructor and then assign that va uh, variable of type battery from the electronic class that it inherited using this dot battery equal to that battery from its constructor. And it's important that the boombox battery from its constructor, it has to have a different name than the state variable that it inherited from electronic. So in the boombox constructor, that variable of type battery that you take can have any name except battery. And then the use method, that's still defined in flashlight, except you have to override. Uh, technically, since this is an abstract method, uh, if you define this as an abstract method, the keyword override specifically is optional, but you do have to override that definition, whether you use the keyword or not. Uh, to do the same thing that you did from the last lecture question, so that's cut and paste from last Friday's lecture question. And then the boombox, do the same thing in boombox, except a charge of three is required to use the boombox instead of a charge of one. So the big thing here is inheritance. And I'd say the trickiest thing here that hasn't been covered in a previous lecture question is how to handle this battery variable. You're extending a class of a certain type, inheriting its variable, and then how do you work with that variable from the class that's extending it? And uh, one thing I see could trip people up, make sure this is a variable, make sure you use var. No, that probably wouldn't trip you up. That'd be tough to make that mistake, actually. So let's see if I can, I might be able to demo something that's close to that without just giving away the answers. We can look through, revisit the, the examples here in the context of what we're doing. 
player I know does this. So like the dynamic object class declares some variable velocity. So this would be similar to your battery being defined in, in the electronic class. We're creating some variable velocity inside this class, not in its constructor, but in in this kind of no man's land where it's code that's outside of any of the methods. All the code that's outside any method is going to be called when we create objects of this type. So when we create a new dynamic object, it's going to create this state variable named velocity of type physics vector. I'm just setting it to some default value, which is the vector 0, 0, 0. But when I create my player class that extends dynamic object, the player class, the way we built this, was to take a velocity as one of its constructor parameters. So when we create a new player, we want to set its initial velocity to something. What I actually want to do with this velocity is just give it to dynamic object and set that variable from dynamic object named velocity that we created, that we inherited from dynamic object. Now, dynamic object doesn't take a velocity in its constructor, so we can't do what we've done before and just give it to the constructor, it, which in that case, we can use the same exact names. I should change all these examples just to get you in the habit of using different names, but we can use the same names as the dynamic object location and dimensions. We use the same exact names there um, and give it to the constructor. But the constructor of dynamic object doesn't take velocity. So instead, we can initialize it out here in no man's land outside of all the methods, which will be called when we create a new player. Uh, we are, it, the code in dynamic object was already called. We already have a velocity variable as part of this as it's being constructed, as the player is being constructed. So we can say this dot velocity to access that variable that was inherited from dynamic object. Here we need a different name for our velocity. I just put an underscore in front of it to specify that, hey, this uh, this is different than the other velocity. So I do this dot velocity equals that velocity that I got in the constructor. And now that set that velocity variable from the super class that I inherited. If I delete this underscore, I'm going to get errors. For example, if I can type. Uh, I'm going to get errors because this dot velocity, what variable should that refer to? Should it refer to the velocity from the constructor or the velocity that was inherited from the dynamic object? Now, we can get away with this just if it's in the constructor line because the constructor just behaves differently. But we can't get away with that if we're doing using these variables anywhere else in the code. So anywhere else in the code, we have to specify that these are different variables, and we do that by naming them different things. Uh, and we can also do new physics vector of, you know, one, two, three, whatever we want to do. We can do anything here. We can even, do I have time for this? Yeah. We can even do something like this. For those of you doing rhyming dictionary, this is probably similar to something you want to do. Is we can create a method and call that method in the class to be called as it's being initialized. So here when I create a new player, maybe I want to set its initial velocity to some return value of a method that I wrote and then put a lot of code in here. Uh, the reason I say rhyming dictionary is you might want to do rhyming dictionary this dot parse dictionary of dictionary file name. You might want to do something like that. And then map of however you want to structure your your thing. My preference is this. Whatever you want to do for yours is fine. Okay, so hopefully that helps with 
LQ21. Can we see a demo of, for calculator and functional programming? In OOP, you mean? Do you mean the the calculator working? I, I don't know what you mean by that, P. Yeah, so we usually do underscore in front of a variable name to say that that's a private variable. Uh, in general, it indicates that, hey, this is something you shouldn't really be looking at. So here, this velocity. So this velocity is something that nobody, this variable that's storing this velocity, is something that nobody should really be messing with. So the underscore is a good indicator of, hey, other programmers, don't mess with this thing, especially outside of the player class. This is just some intermediate variable that I used to solve a problem that I had. In this case, it's just transferring from the constructor to the initialization of a variable that was ex inherited from a superclass. Nobody should be messing with this velocity. Nothing should change between the constructor and this initialization. But the velocity without an underscore, that one, for example, the physics engine is going to need that velocity to be able to update things, to be able to move it, this player around the game board. So that one shouldn't have an underscore because other people need to know what, about that and want to use it. If, uh, if this had an underscore and you're writing fig, uh, physics engine, that underscore is a good indication that you're using the wrong variable because you shouldn't use underscore variables outside of that class, outside of the internal, uh, out, in, internal details of how something works.